Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Intel stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Intel is a technology company headquartered in Santa Clara, California. It is the world's largest semiconductor manufacturer. Intel supplies microprocessors to Lenovo, HP, and Dell. It was founded in 1968. Intel created the world's first commercial microprocessor chip in 1971. It was not until the success of the personal computer that this became its primary business. Intel invested heavily in new microprocessor designs, fostering the rapid growth of the computer industry. Intel became the dominant supplier of microprocessors for PCs and was known for aggressive and anti-competitive tactics in defense of its market position, particularly against advanced micro devices as well as the struggle of Microsoft for control over the direction of the PC industry. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, market cap $195 billion. They're trading at $47 a share and they have 4.1 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you forecast the free cash flows and then you discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. You can see the company doubled their free cash flow from 2017 to 2020. Net income is a profit and loss on the income statement, and they also more than doubled their net income from 2017 to 2020. Their revenue looks really good. It's growing every single year from 63 billion to 78 billion, and their net profit margins are really solid. If a company has a net profit margin above 20%, that's pretty impressive. Net profit margin is net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. They converted 28% of their revenue into profit. That means 72% went towards expenses. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is cost of revenue. The difference between those two numbers is the gross profit. And their gross profit has been growing each year. They had their largest number in 2020 at 44 billion. Then they have operating expenses. And below that is operating income. And that grew by 6 billion from 2017 to 2020. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt minus the interest they received from their investments. Then below that is other income and expenses. This is usually for impairments and investments. They had $25 billion of pre-tax income. They paid $3.7 billion of taxes. So their net income was $22 billion. And that's the highest amount in the past four years. Their net income was $9.6 billion in 2017. The reason for the low net income in 2017 was this $11 billion of taxes. In 2017, the U.S. government applied a one-time tax to companies that kept a lot of funds overseas. It seemed like lots of companies were keeping cash overseas to avoid paying taxes in the U.S. This is the statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. And this is capital expenditures. These are investments in property, plant, and equipment. And when you take operating cash flow minus capex, you get your free cash flow. And that was the largest in 2020, $20 billion. That doubled from 2017. So they're growing their free cash flow each year. It looks like they issued about $22 billion of debt the past four years. And they paid off about $19 billion of debt. Since the company has lots of free cash flow, it looks like they're buying back stock. This is helpful for investors. It's anti-dilutive. It adds value to your investment. It improves the performance of the current shareholders. And it looks like they repurchased $3.6 billion in 2017, then $11 billion, $14 billion, and $17 billion. Let's look at operating cash flow. This is the most important part of any business, how much money you generate from your operational business. If you have negative operating cash flow, you can't sustain a business for a long time doing that. But this company has positive and healthy operating cash flow each year. And to calculate operating cash flow, it's net income, which was $22 billion. Then they had $12 billion of depreciation expenses, which is a non-cash item, so we have to add that back. Then they also had some other things like stock-based compensation and changes in working capital. And this is what you want to see when you invest in a company, a company that's generating a lot of cash so they can provide a dividend and buy back stock to provide you a greater return on investment, plus invest in their business to grow it. Let's look at a capital structure. They have $78 billion of equity, $29 billion of debt. 
and their net debt is 15.9 billion. Net debt is total debt minus cash. They pay 2% interest on their debt, and cost of debt is 1.74%. That's a really low cost of debt. 27% of that capital structure is debt, so 73% is equity. Cost of equity is about 8%. And they have a pretty low beta, 0.73, so the stock moves less than a market. It's not volatile. And their WAC is 6.25%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's $470 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $441 billion. We divide that by 4.1 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 108. They're trading at $47, so they're trading at a 56% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is at $89, so they're also saying the stock is undervalued. So this is the stock price the last five years. It was pretty steady for about a year, year and a half. And the stock price was driven up for a couple of years. And it looks like it's come down from coronavirus. It looks like the stock is trading at a great value. And it looks like the company raises their dividend each year. They're currently paying a 2.78% dividend yield, and their payout ratio is 25%. The other 75% is used to grow the business, pay down debt, and buy back stock. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $30,000 today. If you did not reinvest the dividends, you'd have $27,000. The stock has not performed well the past 52 weeks. It's down 20% compared to the S&P 500, up 15%. And the 52-week low is $44, the high is $69. The stock is trading below its 50-day moving average and 200-day moving average, so it's on a decline. And when the 200-day moving average goes above the 50-day moving average, that's a death cross. That's a bearish signal. And this is a really liquid stock. An average of 35 million shares are traded each day the past three months. And almost all the shares outstanding are on float. Two thirds of the shares are held by institutions and only 1.2% are shorted. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 12.4, the median is 14.8. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 8.9, so investors are paying $9 for $1 of earnings. That's a really good P.E. ratio. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 2.5, also another good ratio. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 2.5, that's a really good ratio as well. And they have $78 billion of equity on their balance sheet. That's assets minus liabilities. But since they've done so many acquisitions, they have a lot of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Of the $78 billion of equity, $41 billion is tangible. The rest is intangible. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They can easily cover their interest payments. ROE is net income over equity. They're at 21%, so they provide a great value to the equity holders. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They're at 1.4, so they can cover their current liabilities. Their current assets are $13 billion of cash. 8 billion of receivables and 9 billion of inventory. And the company seems to be well capitalized. Their free cash flow in the trailing 12 months was $20 billion and they have $9 billion of working capital. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos of 10 companies in the same industry as Intel. And if Intel has a number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they're better in all the price multiples, price to earnings, price to sales, and price to book. Current ratio is worse than average, but 1.4 is fine. They're doing better in ROE, a little more debt than the average. And in terms of market cap, they are doing better than average at $194 billion. And they pay the highest dividend of all the companies. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 56% discount. Their financials and ratios look amazing. And Intel has been around for a long time. They're a solid company. And I don't think this company is going anywhere. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.